Bama and Tennessee is going to be a good one. Welcome into Up to the Second College Football Season 3, Episode 8, presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Enter for your chance to win a $10,000 Academy gift card, plus SEC championship tickets just by signing into the Academy app. The ultimate SEC football sweepstakes runs from October the 8th through November the 18th. No purchase is necessary. Odds depend on entries received. You can find complete rules at academy.com. All right, so on the show today, Billy and Caroline are going to examine... What's wrong with a and Like, seriously, we've been talking about it all week. They're going to try to break it down. Plus, I talked to Jacob Hester about his relationship with Jimbo Fisher, plus how styles make fights, especially this year in the SEC. It's up to the second college football. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, our next guest won a national championship in 2007, spent four years in the NFL. You can catch him on Off Campus on Serious College Football. He is here with us, Jacob Hester. What's up, man? What's going on, man? Always a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate y'all having me. Thank you so much. So I'm going to start off with A&M, and we'll kind of work our way through. I, I don't want to say are you surprised about what's happening at A&M because it's kind of rinse and repeat what we've seen the last couple of years, but based on the changes that they made, are you surprised where we are right now with A&M? All right, so it's a weird feeling because I don't think it's bad football. Like, I truly don't think it's just bad football. I, I think it's a Texas A&M team that just for whatever reason can't get over that hump, can't get from that tier two, you better know that you're playing them, to the tier one. And I don't know what's missing. You've tried to make changes, like you said. You bring in Bobby Petrino. I think the offense has looked better. Certainly at times it has. Even you know with, with your quarterback going out, you still have this reliable backup in Max Johnson. And Max has shown flashes, but he's also you know not played well at times. And so you're just wondering, how do you get over that hump? Because you're like, okay, you got playmakers on the outside. You've got running backs. You still feel good, I think, about your quarterback situation. It's like, what is missing? And then on the defensive side, it's like, you have maulers on the defensive line, the front seven. And so I ask this question all the time. I'm like, what is Texas A&M missing? How are they not going from tier two to tier one? Because during 2020, it's like, all right, they're in tier one and they're here to stay. Like they're going to be here for a long time. And then as you know, like you don't have that success the next season. And then now like you're searching for that success. And so like, it is really, it is one of those things that I pose to a lot of different people because on paper, I see very talented players. I know the coaching staff very well. You watch the games and it's like, man, three plays. N next game, man, three plays. It's just like over and over and over again. And it's a, a situation where it has to be frustrating because you're not far away, but you seem like you're miles away. So what you said there, and I, I know you have a great relationship with Jimbo from your, from your mm -hmm. playing days. Is it Jimbo then? Because to me, at the end of the day, the head coach – is the reason you win and lose games when it's a, they're four and eight in one score game since 21. Yeah. And I, I love Jimbo, by the way. I think it can work with Jimbo, but something's not working. Yeah. No, I mean, you're exactly right. And, and look, full disclosure, I probably wouldn't be here uh, doing this show, doing any show, because nobody would want to talk to me if it wasn't for Jimbo Fisher trusting me and putting me at the running back position when everybody else told me I couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't do it at that level. So I, I am a little biased towards Jimbo, but obviously the stats are the stats. The analytics are the analytics. And I mean, the, the road woes for this team as well, like away from Kyle Field, it's just like you just keep pointing to different things and you're just like, okay, well, you, you got to get that fixed. And then it's like four other stats where like, okay, well, you got to get all four of these things fixed. And, you know, sometimes you, you wonder is the message that the head coach is giving, is it still going through the players? Are they still feeling that message? Is it a lot of empty words and not from Jimbo because he's not meaning what he's saying, but sometimes when things aren't going well and you have all the stats that we're laying out there and what they've done on the road and what they haven't done since 2020, you're, and the one score losses, it's like, okay, well, is the message hitting the players? And that's what you have to really wonder. And then you try something. I say a little outside the box, bringing Bobby Petrino in. I didn't have Bobby Petrino ever coming to be an offensive coordinator at Texas A&M. And still like that hasn't worked. It hasn't equaled wins. And you're starting to wonder, okay, we've tried a couple of different things. Have you tried the Hail Mary pass? Maybe not yet. But it feels like you've had a couple of third and 15s that you've tried to convert on and they just they haven't happened. And you're wondering, OK, are they going to happen? 
Do we have to shuffle things up? Like, how do we get that done? Jimbo Fisher didn't forget how to coach football, but for whatever reason, and look, we all know this, we've all watched enough football. Sometimes it just happens. You get to a point and Les Miles at LSU. Look, I love Les Miles. I, I named my fourth son Memphis Miles Hester after Coach Miles, but there became a point in his LSU tenure. Yeah, and he was still winning some games, but it wasn't enough. Like you felt like there was a disconnect between what he was selling and what the players were trying to buy into. And sometimes that just happens. So do you think they can still make something of the season considering the matchups against Tennessee, Tennessee and Alabama were really good defenses? There's always an excuse, right? There's always something to point at, but (laughs) can they make something of this year? Jacob, do you think they can? They still have games to have that opportunity, right? You still have to play LSU. You still have to play Ole Miss. Now, going on the road against LSU, that's going to be a very difficult game. And we know what that series kind of is. I mean, it has certainly turned into a thing. Ever since the seven-overtime game, that is something that both schools pay attention to at the end of the year. So it's it's a good and bad. It's a bad in the fact that you know what you have left on your schedule, but it's also a good knowing you have those opportunities. So we really won't know until the end of those opportunities. Like if you're playing an Ole Miss team, why can't A&M go win that game? Like some of the things that A&M does really well, certainly defensively, I think that's going to give Ole Miss some problems. And so I truly don't think that we will know until the end of the season. They're going to have those opportunities. But doomsday scenario is going to be what if you lose to Ole Miss? What if you drop a game to LSU at the end, like what does that conversation become? Because we know the expectations in College Station. We know where they want to be. They have not been there yet outside of 2020 where they go win the New Year's Six Bowl game. So you're going to have to wait and see. It could be some promise. And also it can be one of those situations where it gets incredibly hairy there if you lose games to Ole Miss and LSU. Jacob, how did LSU kind of redefine their season? And I know you can point to Jaden Daniels, the amazing season he's having, but it felt like there was a point this season like their season could go one direction. It was the Missouri game, yeah. the fourth quarter, the last couple of minutes, where like it all now feels like, all right, things aren't so bad. Doesn't it really feel like that throughout the entire SEC West a little bit? Uh, I mean, you just look at these teams in Alabama – like they're undefeated in the SEC, but it doesn't feel like it because they've had close games with AM, with Arkansas, with other teams. And then you look at LSU, it's like, which one are you going to get? Are you going to get the one that couldn't find a way against Ole Miss or the one that found a way against a Mizzou team? And then they beat Auburn like they did a week ago. Ole Miss is still kind of in that situation. They lost to Alabama. They beat LSU. Again, I think AM actually has some advantages against them. And so we'll see how it turns out for the Rebs. I, A&M could play spoiler. Auburn at home is a different team. So it has been just wacky in the SEC West. And so it's almost hard to predict. Now, going back to the LSU portion of it, like it does feel like they're figuring some things out defensively because let's let's call it like it is. I mean, they were one of the worst defenses in the country, one of the worst in all the power five. I mean, they were 128th in the country in stop rate. I mean, teams were scoring at an alarming rate. You just, you know, lucky enough to have – Jaden Daniels, who's kind of playing at a Heisman Trophy level. And it's kind of interesting if they would have caught that pass in the end zone against Ole Miss, what would that conversation about Jaden Daniels be in the Heisman Trophy? And so he always gives you an opportunity, right, for LSU. And if they can just figure out things enough on defense, it's kind of like we used to talk about with USC a year ago, right? Caleb Williams making all these plays. You don't have to be the best. Just be like 65th Mm -hmm. in the country in total defense, and you're going to win a lot of games. You're going to have an opportunity. So LSU is figuring some of those things out. Jane Daniels has played at a high level. Like this last week against Auburn, I think that was big for him because remember last year, he would play bad in that game. He had like 80 yards passing, no touchdowns. The defense and John Emery really won that game for them. And so for him to go out there, have that game against that team, that's important. So some of the games where he struggled a year ago, I think you're seeing a different Jaden Daniels. And it's going to be interesting because the matchup against Alabama, that's not an awful one for LSU. Like, I actually think that the Alabama matchup for LSU was better than the Ole Miss matchup for LSU. And I know that's wild to say, considering how things have played out between Ole Miss and Alabama. So, look, I expect chaos. There's going to be chaotic energy at the SEC West finish line. And I'm here for it, though. You made me laugh because you said something that I've said on this show for, I think, two years. Uh, you said, if they're 65th in the country, right? I've said that about the AM offense, and I know they yeah. are numbers-wise, but not in the SEC. They're p- towards the bottom. If they could just be middle of the road, we're talking about a team that's potentially undefeated in SEC play. But l- let's move on to the big game this weekend, Tennessee-Bama. Uh, 
Tennessee is a team that I, I, I haven't figured out. I don't think anybody has because their defense is so good. Offensively, a little bit kind of still TBD. Bama, Jalen Milrow now looks to be doing pretty well, but super close games with everybody. Yeah. I think to really have an opportunity to beat Alabama, you have to be dynamic on offense. You just, you do. And that defense is playing at a high level. I I think the offense is doing just enough. But I just think if you can't score points against that team, you're going to have trouble. Like Texas is dynamic offense, right? And they came in Tuscaloosa and they took care of them. Like KJ Jefferson last week, like the offense might not be dynamic, but we have seen KJ Jefferson a handful of times just take over a game by himself and almost will his team to victory. He almost did it against LSU this year in Baton Rouge. And so, like, you have to have that. And I'm not sure Tennessee has that. In fact, I know Tennessee right now does not have that. Joe Milton has not been the quarterback that we saw. All the talk was about how far he could throw the football, but that doesn't really matter how far you can throw the football. You got to be able to go through your progressions, hit your open receivers. So I don't know that that's a great matchup for Tennessee. Now, running the football – They've been incredibly efficient. But if I'm Alabama, I am daring Joe Milton to have to beat me, right? And so I look at that matchup, and I think last year, why did Tennessee beat Alabama? Because they had Hendon Hooker, they had Hyatt, they had all these weapons where they could really outmatch them, and they could be that NASCAR pace, just go down the field. I don't see that from this year's Tennessee team. And so I look at some of the other matchups that Alabama still has, and I don't think this is going to be one that's going to be very difficult for them. And I know, look, I know Tennessee just beat A&M. That's a better matchup, in my opinion, for them. Like, look at the way Florida treated Tennessee, right? So every, like the SEC this year, to me, man, it is all about matchups. It is all about your style. Styles make fights, and it is showing in the East and the West this year so far. Jacob, great stuff, man. Thanks so much for joining us here. Absolutely. Anytime. Keep hey, keep Luch in line. I know sometimes <laughs> he can wander a little bit. Just keep him in line. You got it, man. Thanks again. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels, plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, coming up next, Billy and Caroline try to figure out the problems with A&M and everything else happening there in the SEC. Welcome into Up to the Second, brought to you over by our friends over at Academy. He's Billy Lucci. I am Caroline Fenton. And Billy, I know the AM fans are feeling it after the loss in Neyland Stadium. It was a gross, gross game. Joe Milton couldn't connect with a receiver to save his life. The Texas AM front could not stop the Tennessee rushing attack. What's the vibe? How are we feeling? Well, you know the vibe because for once a year, you and I are in the same stadium watching an A&M game, and that was uh, that was the one. This one, this one didn't go as well as la- the last one. Uh, so you were up there at ne- at Neyland Stadium with me. Uh-huh. Uh, we we got to hang out the day before, talked about the game. It was a blast. I, I think, yeah, it was great. It was a great time. The trip was awesome. I I love the Tennessee experience. I thought the. Uh, the volunteer fans were awesome. Even you know, even the ones that were shouting me out as I was walking back and forth down there. The students, so shout Maybe out. Maybe not Tennessee saying students. the nicest things. A couple of them, but most of them were fun. I had, a, I mean, I thought the Tennessee fans. I'd heard mixed reviews. Mm-hmm. I thought they were great, and, and people walking around the town, and and you know, the the week, the whole weekend, walking around campus on Friday. Everything was awesome. I thought the game day atmosphere, like from the time you walk into the stadium, to me, and people have told me it's Tennessee and Kyle Field. Yeah. And and I agree. Like those those were the two uh those stand out to me. Your your Death Valley at night is, is a different one too. Yeah, those are to me, those are the three that really uh, stand out, and I put Tennessee above above um, Bama and Athens in terms of just in the game. So those were my takeaways. Knoxville, a lot bigger uh, city than I thought. It's not a college town, obviously, but like I was telling you, I never really put any thought into it. Like, is Tennessee a college town or not? 
So it was n I never had to make that decision. I just kind of went in <laughs> blind, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a city. We did a lot of walking. Um, the game went like we thought in terms of a close game where one team had the ball in the last possession with a chance to tie. Mm -hmm. If you would have told me that, I would have said, hell, yeah. I would have probably disagreed with the 20 to 13 score. But when you watch that game and you saw – Caroline, I saw some people around the SEC, uh, including Cousin Shane over there at, you <laughs> know, with SEC Mike, and they said they thought you know, A&M was clearly the better team and Tennessee won. If that's true, then that's – you know, it's credit to Tennessee, indictment on A&M – but also that's a way of saying Tennessee, you're still not very good. I kind of disagree. I thought it was two teams that, yeah, I, I sat there at, at, uh, sitting on the other side of it, and I could see 8 million different ways the Aggies could have won that game. Uh, but Tennessee made about 20 mistakes, and A&M made about 30 mistakes, it felt like, and that was the difference. It was just like that was one of those Saturdays where I don't think either team played or looked very good with the exception of, of three components. Uh, the Tennessee running backs. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how much was the O-line. It was the Tennessee running backs. They did a great job of being patient, kind of hiding behind things, and then busting out. A&M lost contain a few times. They were tough to tackle. And both D-lines dominated. Yeah. Even though A&M gave up 230 yards, the, the A&M D-line, the Tennessee D-line, and the Tennessee running backs. And that was it. And the difference were the Tennessee running backs to me uh, one special, two special teams plays because that punt got him down there and set up that return. And honestly, Caroline, I think a &M mistakes. You know, you, you go, you drop a pass on third and two, you know, critical third and two near midfield <laughs> or an underthrow, actually. It was a poor throw. You quarterback trips on fourth and one coming out. There were just so many things that the Aggies did to shoot themselves in the foot in that one. It was... It was hard to watch, and I think A&M fans, you know, it, this entire season and last three seasons have been hard to watch. It was a tough game to watch from both perspectives because it was two teams that played really good defense and struggled to throw the football. I yeah. mean, Joe Milton had fewer than 40 passing yards going into the half. Never has a Josh Heupel coached quarterback had fewer than 40 passing yards at the half. And never has Josh Heupel, whether it's at UCF or at Tennessee in his six seasons as a head coach, ever won a football game by scoring fewer than 30 points. Really? They scored 20 I, and seven of those came off a special teams play. Yeah, so, I thought both defenses were were really good but it was a it was a byproduct of bad passing games too and on a &M side it was like zero protection zero and it's wild that the two run games i thought you know carried the teams offensively because those are two teams that i think the defensive strengths are the defensive front like yeah. the secondaries i don't think for either side for texas a&m or tennessee are really anything to write home about but that's how good those fronts are and you know credit mm -hmm. to tim banks tennessee's defensive coordinator tennessee's yeah. defense last year was awful yeah. awful it, but it often got overshadowed by how good tennessee's offense was like tennessee could get into shootouts week in and week out because their offense was just better than everyone else's you know they might give up 38 40 points a game but they could score 45 50 so it's it, it's a weird dichotomy and it's a weird you know just 180 from one year to the next but I think that that's just kind of the Joe Milton experience um you know credit to, to Tennessee's defensive line they got pressure on Max Johnson all day long and I, I'm interested to get your perspective on this because a Tennessee fan asked me how different would that game have been had Connor been in under center mm. instead of Max Johnson? And I thought, you know, I, I still think that it would have been fairly low scoring, but I think Connor would have been able to make something out of nothing a little bit more than Max could. I think Connor was, is so good at making throws on the run, at being incredibly mobile, and Max, credit to Max, he made so many so passes, so tough and made so many completions 
while he's, you know, halfway to the ground that I'm thinking there's no way, like, get, just, just get rid of yeah. it or just hold on to the football and boom, <laughs> seven yard completion. I'm thinking, okay, if that's yeah. working for you, then go ahead. But no quarterback should be subjected to the, the beating he took, the physical beating. I give him all no. the credit in the world. 100%. Um, I think if you give Max Johnson time to throw, he can pick a defense apart. He can make incredible throws. You saw it early on that first drive of the game. Um, they're going to have to figure out a way to block better moving forward. Now, part of it will be, I think they just played the two best D-lines they'll play. Yeah. Ole Miss is underrated defensively right now. People just don't think that of them because of the offense under Lane Kiffin. But I still think they played the two best defenses and f- certainly the two best defensive fronts mm-hmm. they'll face, and the a and line got exposed. They're going to have to play a lot better, more of what we saw against Arkansas and, and Auburn in the second mm-hmm. half. And when they do, Max can Max can thrive. In an in an environment like the last two weeks, I do think that's where they've really missed Connor uh from the standpoint of he just he he can extend plays. He has a natural feel for that pressure that you really just can't coach and, and right. it doesn't necessarily have to come with experience. And he gets the ball out very quickly. Very quickly. So yeah, those are the strengths of his game and and yeah, that this this combination of lack of protection and and Max being I think a lot more deliberate or liking to preferring to take those bigger shots are part of the problem. I know a lot of people are saying, well, A and M doesn't you know they're not dialing up quick stuff for him. There are a lot of those handoffs where he does have the option to pull it and throw it out, you know, to Evan Stewart or maybe Anaya mm-hmm. Smith out there um, in the bubble game, and and sometimes it it is a byproduct of him not choosing to do that so I do think he needs to help himself a little bit also so uh yeah I think Connor helps in those games but look you had a a very experienced quarterback for a reason that's had some really good games in the SEC in his career he's a he's a tough dude he's a competitor players love him they just gotta realize hey our QB needs better protection I'm not saying he didn't make mistakes in that game or that he played well because I, right. I do think he made mistakes and I don't think he played well. But I think it would be difficult for any quarterback to play well under that kind of heat and that kind of duress. So it starts up front for AM. We mm-hmm. said that going into the season. We said that when Connor got hurt. We knew this was coming. Um, and we said it throughout last year. So it's a recurring theme. I guess during the bye week, Caroline, we can talk. We're, we're on a time crunch this week. During the bye, we can talk more about A and M, Jimbo, and what lies ahead. You know, these final four games of the SEC schedule and the importance of all that. Because we're on that crunch, so let's shelve that for next week. That ought to be fun. Give you some time to prep. Uh, let's dive into LSU briefly. Yeah. You were you always you told me the Auburn LSU games can always get crazy. They always get tricky. That wasn't the case this week. LSU Thank handled goodness. business. Yeah, Ugh. they just went out and handled it, didn't they? They did. And I think that's what me as a fan and the rest of the fan base and really this team needed. Because yeah. you ha- the last three weeks, Arkansas, uh, Ole Miss, Missouri. Missouri, yeah. It was an offensive shootout. It came down to the final few seconds in the final possession. And it was like like something just has to give. And I always feel like I can never truly project the Auburn LSU game. But also I was looking at the matchups of an Auburn defense that's good, not great, but maybe the best defense that LSU had seen since Florida State. And then a defense, an LSU defense that's horrendous and an Auburn passing attack that also is horrendous. So I thought there's makings for this to be an interesting game. I think it was a huge confidence boost for this LSU team. Look, you gave up more passing yards to Auburn than any other team in the SEC has. Fine. I, fine. Yeah, but I can live fine. with that. It was yeah. still 153. You only gave up 18 points. You had a massive stop in the beginning of the third quarter with a Harold Perkins sack that kind of avoided disaster. LSU was up 20 to 7. If they would have scored on that possession, then it's 20 to 14 yeah, and things get are little, getting interesting. No, yeah, you get a little get uncomfortable. Yeah. 20 to 10, that's a much different ball game. LSU gets the ball back and then on every single possession in the second half they were able to score a touchdown. So yeah. I think it was a confidence boost for the defense to say, "Hey, we just beat up on an SEC team and only gave up 18 points and fewer yards than we have in all of SEC play. And now you get Army. I, 
And now you get Army, a team that just lost to Troy 19 to nothing. And then you yeah. have the bye. And then you have Alabama. Wow. I didn't Oxford. realize it set up that nicely. That yeah. Missouri game's looking more and more important, isn't it? That it second do- half it is. Mizzou. Absolutely. And I looked at October for LSU and I thought that is your get right month, which yeah. is, I think, a privilege in the SEC that October is not the, the brunt of your schedule. Of course, yeah. Missouri looked a lot less daunting preseason than it does than it does now. Um, but it's a it was a it was a confidence boost for the LSU defense. This week is a get right game against a team that you should beat and you should beat handedly. Hopefully you can get some backup, some work then everyone can get healthy and get right before Alabama and you hit the road in Bryant Denny the first Saturday of November. I thought Ole Miss could get Bama because it was offense versus a lack of offense. And then that Bama defense showed me how good they really are. But mm-hmm. this LSU offense to me is different. And it's different than the Ole Miss offense. I mean, the Ole Miss offense looked sensational against LSU's wretched secondary. But outside of that, uh, they haven't looked quite that unstoppable. Um, they haven't gone up. Now, I think the LSU offense does look like that mm-hmm. pretty much weekly. I We'll talk about it next, you know, as it gets here, but I'm, I'm liking LSU's chances at Bryant-Denny more and more. I'm not ready to pick them yet. I'll, I'll judge that a lot based off this weekend. So before we close it out, let's talk a couple of SEC games here. We've yeah. got the big South Carolina, Missouri. I, I just I circled that one because I'm just like, is that a trap game for Mizzou who's sitting on one loss right now? I don't think it is. I think Missouri and and Eli Drinkwitz might be SEC Coach of the Year at this point. I think they get through it. Do you think they have anything to be scared of there? Uh, against the Gamecocks and Spencer Rattler. I think that Spencer Rattler in and of itself is something to be scared of because Spencer yeah. Rattler's playing an incredibly high level. Like if you yeah. put an Alabama jersey on Spencer Rattler, Ooh. I mean, like You're he right. might be a Heisman contender. And they, but would, this they South, would not have lost. They would not have lost to Texas. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. But this South Carolina defense is truly awful. And this South, excuse me, this Missouri offense is going to be able to take advantage of it. Like, I don't think that this Missouri defense is going to be able to bully all up on Spencer Rattler. Like, they're going to put some points up. I just think Missouri's offense is going to feast on South Carolina. And Missouri's Missouri's identity all season long has been very blue-collar, chip on our shoulder, nobody believes in us except us. Well, now yeah. people are believing. Now people are buying in. Now you're a top 25 team. And everyone's looking at you like you are – up there with the Tennessees and the Georgias of the SEC East. Don't get your head too big. That's an Eli Drinkwitz thing. Yeah. That's going to be on that. Yeah, that's his his job this week is to keep him his team focused against a team that I think that they should route by two or three scores. But honestly, now I, I would take Missouri, and I think it's going to be fairly easy for them this week to take care of South Carolina. Things aren't looking so hot in Columbia. Like I like Tennis. bowl game might even be in question for South Carolina. Yeah, I think it is. And then they come to Kyle Field next against the A&M team off a of bye. Yeah. Uh, Luther Burden, I'm setting the over-under on about 200 receiving yards against that defense. Over. Yeah. <laughs> Missouri Missouri, and Tennessee, that's the one I can't wait that's to see in the SEC. I mean, SEC East. Still, I think, a battle for number two. Uh, let's talk before we go into the big game real quick. Speaking of the East, Brock Bowers – Yes. Your man out for a significant period of time. I know he's going to try to get back. You know, this is really a whole different discussion of whether he should come try to come back and rush mm-hmm. it. You know he's going to. He's that type of competitor. But totally. what a devastating blow for the Bulldogs. I, can they navigate their the next the regular season without him and come out unscathed? Because he's been such a part of that offense not just for the past couple of years, but this season in particular when they, they're struggling at times to find other parts of it. He's the best player in college football. You know, yeah. like you don't lose a guy like that that has been the foundation of this Georgia offense and think that they're going to be able to just seamlessly replace him just because they're the Georgia Bulldogs. I think it falls on two groups. One, it falls on everyone else. Oscar Delp, Georgia's backup tight end. You're the next man up. It falls on Rara and Dominic Levette and Lad McConkey and the rest of that receiving core to step up and at least try to fill that number 19 sized hole. 
But I also think that this is even bigger on Carson Beck because Carson Beck has had Brock Bowers to bail him out of really tricky situations. Like Brock Bowers has been his safety net. I think he'd be a safety net for any quarterback in college football. So that's no knock on Carson Beck, but now it's an even bigger challenge to try and you know look at the entire field and you've got a plenty of other pass catching op- options to go to. It's just a matter of breaking out of your comfort zone and credit to Mike Bobo too. I'm, I'm excited to see yeah. how Mike Bobo can kind of break out the playbook a little bit more now that, you know, he also doesn't have that security blanket of F it Brock's down there somewhere. F it Brock's going to be able to win any 50, 50 battle that you put him I like into. It. It's the F it's the F it. We got Brock offense. Always. Yeah. And now you don't have props. So let's 19. see what you got. See, F, F at 19's 19 out there offense. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, and- I, I agree. I think they're going to, I think they're going to figure it out and figure out ways to win. Um, although watching that volunteer defense, I'll tell you without Brock, I think that Tennessee defense can keep that a very low scoring game and, and that could get, that could get pretty interesting, I think. I we'll see. Tennessee. And it's in Neyland. Yeah, and it's in Neyland. That that is a red flag one. I think it would have been anyway, but it's especially so now. I think uh Tennessee's got more important, you know, situation right in front of them. Yeah. They can worry about Georgia later. Man, they could make that Georgia game big on the national scene if they could get by this Saturday at Bryant Denny, Alabama looking for revenge. As an Aggie and, you know, the a and fans that are tuned in, which are plenty of them, we've watched these teams the last two weeks. I would certainly say QB advantage Jalen Milrow based yeah. on what I've watched in person. But over the course of the season, I don't consider that a very big advantage. Um, I think Milrow's been very inconsistent. Uh, I, do, I, I do think when he's on... He, he can connect down the field, but I think he takes a ton of sacks. I think that Tennessee defensive line is really good. They got after A&M. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've gotten after everybody this year. Man, the, my over-under on that one is like 14 sacks between Milton and – 14 sacks taken between Milton and, and Milrow. But I'm almost to the point where I'm going, which, which quarterback – is on that day. I guess I'm going to slightly go with the guy playing at home. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee ran for 230 on A&M. Alabama ran for 23. Just, I'm just asterisking that one. And, and A&M's great against the run, and they ran for 230, and Alabama's great against the run. Uh, I think that Tennessee running game is far superior to Alabama's. And, and that with two quarterbacks that you don't really know what you're going to get, for some reason that's just ringing in my head as I'm thinking about this football game. But Tennessee has the best run game in the SEC. And they've got a yeah. trio of running backs. It's not just your running back and your quarterback. It's Dylan Sampson, Jabari Small, and Jalen Wright. And they can all burn you at the line of scrimmage. But I, for me, it comes down to coach and quarterback. Coach, whatever. Yeah. Team Alabama is playing, they're going to have the coaching advantage. It's it's no Nick question. Saban. Quarterback is interesting because it comes down to me of which quarterback isn't going to screw up more. You know, like who's going to F things up less? Yeah, I think I have to trust Jalen Milrow because at this point, I, I don't trust Joe Milton to not turn the football over. I don't mm-hmm. trust Joe Milton to throw the deep ball. I also don't trust Joe Milton to throw the intermediate ball, nor do I trust yeah. Joe Milton to make Gosh. the easy layups. Like he can't yeah. even throw a screen pass. Very inaccurate. I could just ask Joe Milton to be a game manager, but he can't even do that. And when he, you're doing that against Bama coverage, I do yeah. think you're going to have a problem. And that Tennessee running game, for as much as they kind of cut up AM, they did it. And, and it's credit, the yards are the yards. It's not like they had one 99-yard run that skewed the numbers. But they were doing it with chunk plays. There were a lot of zero to one, two-yard gains, negative yardage plays. Uh, when they had to get it on a couple short yardage downs, they couldn't. Uh, they got it a couple times, but, I mean, they were hit or miss in that regard. So if they can't get those chunk runs against Bama, then what does that offense look like? And like you said, remember – 
Their offense scored 13 points Saturday. They produced one one offensive touchdown in the game against A and M at home. I, if I'm picking this one, Carolina, I'm, I'm be reluctantly picking Bama. That Tennessee running game versus the Bama running game, it does jump out at me. Mm-hmm. But Tennessee on the road, I think, is a completely different team than Tennessee on at home. I said that before last weekend. You see them at Florida. You saw them at home against a and i I'm going to go with Bama close and low scoring. They beat Arkansas 24-21. They beat A&M, was it 26-20? I, I'm thinking a, a you know, 24-23-17 tied over the Vols on Saturday. What's your, what's your pick? And then take us home. And we'll have a lot to talk about next week during a bye for A&M. And LSU plays Army. So it might be a good State of the Union, SEC, also college football week for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll have a bunch to break into next week. But I t- I'm i taking Bama. It's a nine and a half point mm-hmm. spread. I don't think they're going to be able to beat Tennessee by that much just because yeah. Tennessee's defense is that good. But I agree with you. I think it's going to be a polar opposite of last year's game where the mm-hmm. quarterbacks were supermen and it was an incredibly high scoring game, 52 to 49. Yeah. Erase everything you knew about yeah, that wow. game, and it's going to be complete <laughs> opposite. It's going to be winning despite your quarterbacks, and it's going to be who can score the most points under 30. I think yeah. it could be like a, a 27 to 24, a 27 mm-hmm. to 21 game. I'm taking Alabama to win it because Morgan. I trust Jalen Milrow more, and Tennessee's not great away from home. They haven't yeah. lost yeah. a game at home since Georgia in 2021, but they uh, looked awful in the yeah. swamp. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, with with Young, Bryce Young and Hennon Hooker, and now it's Jalen Milrow and Joe Milton, and I shouldn't be saying anything because those two quarterbacks just went 2-0 and against A&M the last two weeks. But, look, i put it this way. I think Bama wins, even if Tennessee wins. I don't think Morgan Wallen's writing any songs about this one. I think it's going to yeah. be <laughs> ugly, sloppy, and and – Kind of a battle of attrition. So it's got to be gross. I, I but it's like a sickos committee any, game. Yeah, there's no Morgan Wallen uh, new <laughs> drops tonight. I don't think him and Peyton Manning are going to be singing over at Hound or uh, what are my bars over there? Uh, Calhoun's. No, you know what? What's the one? Gosh, the I can't believe we can't. I can't think of the bars. I feel like I'm disrespecting all my Bama friends here. Oh, 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 in, in Tuscaloosa? Galettes? Galettes and the one that's like an eight-mile walk down the other way. Oh. Is Rounders skil- in Tuscaloosa? Skil- it's like Skit. Oh, what is it? I forget the name of it. No, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Our, our buddy, our, our my, our buddy Jade Sailor will be pissed off at me for not remembering the name of that bar. Well, Jade it's... will just have to give us another tour of Tuscaloosa next time we head up there. Hey, between that and the tour of of Nashville, I don't know if I can handle a Tuscaloosa tour. I like <laughs> just going in and just kind of finding my way around there. Just bopping uh, around. Hey, finding Knoxville's whatever line isn't forever long. Yeah, Knoxville's <laughs> yeah, a blast. Exactly. Knoxville's Knoxville a good and time. Tuscaloosa right now standing out as my my two favorites, other than. Uh, other than the results Saturday. So, Caroline, great weekend in Knoxville. Great episode. I know you got to run. I got to run. We've got Le'Veon Moss coming in. And uh, we'll talk next week. A lot of State of the Union in the SEC, we'll call it. A lot of State of the Union, some good games to break down and to preview next week. So, for Billy Lucci, I'm Caroline Fenton. This is Up to the Second. Appreciate everybody watching here up to the second college football presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. We'll be talking next week after AM's bye week and getting ready for South Carolina plus all the other big games in the SEC. We'll see you then.